Yep. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We're so thrilled to welcome you to this wonderful evening. Um, we wanted to, before we get started, thank the Best family for their continued sponsorship of this year in memory of Michael Best, Ella Vashalom. Thank you for your support. May this be as a hoot for his memory. Rabbi David Foreman is an internationally renowned lecturer on biblical themes and the founder and principal educator at Aleph Beta. He has served as an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University and as a lead writer and editor for Art Scrolls Talmud Translation Project. Rabbi Foreman has also served as scholar for the Hofberger Foundation for Torah Study. He is the author of The Beast That Crouches at the Door, a finalist for the 2007 National Jewish Book Award. The Queen You Thought You Knew and The Exodus You Almost Passed Over. His latest book project is the Parsha Companion series, a five volume collection on the weekly Parsha. Genesis and Exodus are available. Stay tuned for the next three volumes coming soon. Rabbi Foreman spent his childhood years in the San Francisco Bay Area, where he reveled in the opportunity to hike in Yosemite National Park. Currently lives in Woodmere, New York with his wife and children, but is still game to head back to Yosemite at a moment's notice. I'm Elliot Cohn, the executive director of the YU Torah Mitzion Kolel here in Chicago. And without further ado, I want to once again thank the Best Family for sponsoring and let you know that tonight's shear is called Yosef Ben Yemen and the Origin Story of Bedigat Chametz. Without further ado, Rabbi Foreman. Okay, thank you very much uh, to you and Elliot and to uh, and a great welcome to everybody else here. Um, just a quick um, housekeeping note, uh, we're on Zoom and um, we have a little bit of a crowd, but uh, typically I do things interactively. So if I ask you a question, it's a genuine question um, and you can just grab the microphone and reply or raise your hand and reply or you can reply in the chat. I'll do my best to read the chat, but it's hard to talk and read the chat at the same time. So you can feel free to just gra grab the microphone and, um, uh, and respond. Um, I want to talk to you tonight, as the title of this talk suggests, about Badikat Hametz, which is kind of right around the corner. And by the way, you're welcome to um, uh, unmute yourself or unmute your cameras, whatever you, whatever you, as you like. Um, Anyway, uh, B'dikat Chametz is right around the corner. B'dikat Chametz, the search for Chametz is a strange sort of mitzvah. Um, it's a mitzvah that the way we perform it seems ceremonial. Um, we go hiding uh, stuff that, we go hiding these little packets of Chametz, which we then expect to find, and we then go hunt them down sort of ceremoniously by the light of a candle. Um, it seems ceremonial, um, but it's interesting that the ceremony of it seems almost, you know, baked into the, um, baked into the law in a, in a very strange kind of way. What I'd like to do with you tonight is to explore with you the roots, the biblical roots of B'dikat Chametz. When we think of B'dikat Chametz, we often think of it as a minag, as a custom, um, with, uh, without deep biblical roots, but the biblical roots are very profound. And I think if we explore them, we'll get a sense of what B'dikat Chametz is trying to do for us and how we should look at the search for Chametz from a spiritual perspective. Um, so without any further ado, let me kind of jump in. And what, I'm gonna jump in with um, uh, maybe just a general overarching question, um, which is that when we think about um, the exodus from Egypt, it seems to me that one of the questions that sort of hangs over the Seder night um, is that at some level, uh, when we look at how it was that we as the people of Israel entered into exile in Egypt, um, the way we got there was sort of cataclysmic from a family relationship standpoint. Um, Basically, we got there because if you look at Genesis 37, 
uh, Genesis 37, Breshit Lamed Zion, suggests that Yaakov Avinu, fresh from uh, his time in Lovin's house, comes down to Israel and has every expectation of being able to set up a nation there. Uh, the beginning of chapter 37 tells us, the Yesh of Yaakov, Beretz Mugurei Aviv, Beretz Canaan, the Yaakov settled in the land of Canaan, in the place that his ancestors had only been able to sojourn, that at some level, until now, the people of Israel had only been guests in their own land. They had been sojourners, strangers in their own land, but all that would change now. By Yeshev Yaakov, Eretz Mugurei he was going to settle down there. And if you would have interviewed Yaakov at the time, he would have told you, sure, you know, he's, he's there to build his nation and everything's going to be great. Um, and yet it doesn't happen. No sooner do we get those words than we're introduced to Yosef, 17 years old. We're introduced to, uh, to a, a very tempestuous family dynamic with the brothers of Yosef hating him and Yosef seemingly having these dreams of grandeur. Before you know it, Joseph is thrown in a pit, carted off to Egypt as the first slave um, in uh, the uh, as the first Hebrew slave in Egypt, uh, with the entire populace to follow. And um, suddenly, these carefully laid plans of Yaakov Avinu to be able to set up the people of Israel, the land of Israel, are dashed into smithereens. And we go down into exile from Egypt, basically with one, one set of brothers betraying another, what, betraying another brother. And that's what gets us down to exile. And the question is, if that's what gets us down to exile, at some level, do we have to deal with that on our way out? It seems strange that it doesn't seem like we do, that at some level, um, you know, the people of Israel leave and they leave with signs and wonders. And yet, what about Mechir Yosef? What about the sale of Yosef? Does that ignominious way that we come into exile influence our, not just how we came down to Egypt, but how we leave Egypt. And that's a question that I want to kind of put out there to sort of hang over the general discussion that we're going to have tonight. So leaving that question in the back of your minds, let me introduce you to the very first Mishnah in the Tractate Psachim, which, and the commentary of Ravavadi Bartanura on that Mishnah, which gives us the biblical sources as the Gemara presents them for Badikas Chametz, for the search for Chametz. First mission in Psachim talks about Badikas Chametz, and it says, Orlar Baasar, on the evening of the 14th of Nisan, Bod Kineta Chametz Laor Haner. And the one thing that we're told is that we search for Chametz Laor Haner by the light of the candle. And it turns out that that description of the Mishnah, that we search for Chametz by the light of the candle, is enough to pique the interest of the Gemara. The Gemara wants to know why that's the mo modality. Why is it? that we search for chametz by the light of a candle? What's the spiritual meaning of using a candle to search for chametz? And the Gemara then launches into a, a series of derivations, which are nothing short of head spinning at face value. There, it's a very difficult and strange to understand sort of derivations. And really everything we do this evening is going to be an attempt to understand what in the world the Gemara means here with its seemingly head-spinning series of derivations for how we understand that we're supposed to search for chametz by the light of a candle. Here's what the what Ravavadi Bartanura, the great commentator of the Mishnah, gives us by way of a summary of the Gemara's derivations. So the Gemara says, that Badikas chametz has to be done by candlelight. How do we know? So it's through a series of three verses. Here's the first verse. The first verse talks about um, talks about chametz, and this appears in Exodus chapter twelve, and it says soor lo yimatzei bebatechem that soor or sourdough or chametz leavened bread lo yimatzei bebatechem shall not be found in your houses. Now, that word lo yimatse, grammatically, is an, 
is a fairly unusual, it's not unique, but it's a fairly unusual um, form of the Hebrew root matzah, right? Matzah means to find, yimatze means to be found, so or lo yimatze, it's a sort of a passive way of explain of, of passive form of the verb. So or sourdough, lo yimatze, shall not be found in your houses. So the Gemara says, well, how do we know that the search for chametz has to be done by candlelight? We start with the verse in Exodus 12 that says, so or lo yimatze, that, that leaven should not be found in your houses. But then we add to that another verse, a verse in Genesis chapter 44, the story of Joseph and his brothers. At the climax of that story, you may be familiar, right? There's a very, very strange episode in which Yosef um, has been masquerading at, as this high Egyptian official, is in fact a high Egyptian official, but he's been interacting with his brothers and the brothers do not know it's him. He of course recognizes the brothers, but the brothers don't recognize him. And Yosef's been tormenting them a little bit. Yosef has been telling them that if they have any hope of having a food, that in him giving them the food which they request, the bread which they request, that he needs to see his younger brother, Benjamin. However, strangely enough, when Benjamin finally shows up, no sooner does Benjamin show up in the brother's hands than Yosef frames Benjamin. He sends the brothers out and he sends them out with um, these provisions and their sacks, but he also takes his silver goblet and he places the silver goblet in the sack of Benjamin uh, surreptitiously. And he dispatches his troops, his henchmen to go catch up with the party. And he searches, shakes them down, has his officers search the party, finds the silver goblet in the sack of Benjamin, hauls them all back and accuses them of theft, right? It's a very strange story. So in the context of that story, when Joseph's henchmen shake everyone down and they search through all the sacks, the word that appears is that same word matzah in that same grammatical formulation, that same sort of passive formulation. The same way that sor aloyi matzeh babatechem we have another version, we have another instance of the word lo yimatze, now in Genesis, and it, of yimatze in Genesis, and it says vayimatze hagavia, right? Which is that the silver goblet of Joseph was found in the sack of Benjamin. So the Gemara says, hmm, we have this un unusual word yimatze in connection to us not finding leaven bread, so orlo on Passover, we shouldn't find leaven in our houses. And it also says back in the story of Joseph that the silver goblet was found, that same version of found, the via the silver goblet was found in Benjamin's sack. So the Gemara then says, Ma metzia ha'amura sham al yirei chipus, shenemar vayichapes b'gadol echel the Gemara says that if you look carefully, now again, the, what I'm about to tell you, I just want to warn you, this it's a head spinning series of verses, right? So it's it's almost like if you've ever played Mousetrap, right? You ever play Mousetrap at home, right? This Rube Goldberg kind of contraption. So you literally have this Rube Goldberg kind of contraption of verses, right? And it, so just listen carefully and you'll see how the Mousetrap is put together. Gemara says that when the, uh, the, the silver goblet was found in Benjamin's sack, if you look at that verse, right, you'll find that it says that they searched for that silver goblet. They said, it says, uh, that they searched, but Gadol Hechel, they started with the oldest, they ended with the youngest, and Vayimatzei Hagavia. And ultimately, the gavia, the silver goblet, was found in the sack of Benjamin. But the first verb was that they found. So the Gemara says, hmm, I've got these two verses, right? I've got this idea that so you might say that leaven shouldn't be found in our houses. But I have this other verse that says that 
the silver goblet was found in Binyamin Sack. Now, the silver goblet being found in Binyamin Sack was associated with searching. So just as that was associated with searching, so too finding leaven in our houses should also be associated with searching. In other words, we should search for leaven in our houses, just as there was a search for the silver goblet in Benjamin Sack. So then the Gemara says, hmm, but how would you conduct that search? Right, okay, so you should, should, should search for leaven, but how do you know that you search for leaven by candlelight? So the Gemara says, well, I'm glad you asked. Here's how you know. You know, because you know that word chipus, that word for searching, the word for searching, which applied to the search of Benjamin Sack, that we're saying by extension should apply to the, the, the search for leaven. That word for searching, chipus, that always implies, the Gemara says, searching by candlelight. How do you know? Uh, for this, we bring a third verse. We bring a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, Mishlei chapter 20, has a verse that says, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, a candle of God is the soul of man. Chofes kol chadre baten. It searches all of the insides of one stomach. Ner Hashem nishmat adam. A candle of God is the soul of man. Chofes, there's that word for search. Chofes kol chadre baten. It searches all the insides of your stomach. So the Gemara says, ah, so I associate searching with candles because it says, a candle of God is the soul of man. The candle of God searches all the insides of your heart. So I see from there that the word chofes is associated with candles. I have chofes associated with the search for Benjamin's goblet. And I have this Benjamin's goblet being associated with Sorla Yimatse, not finding leaven in your house. Ergo, I have to search for leaven by the light of the candle. It really feels like mousetrap. Like if you followed that, you get a prize, right? You know what I mean? Like if by now you're following, you get a prize, right? Like how, how, how do you even follow this? It just seems like this, this, this snaking connected verse by verse by verse. And, and just none of these verses really seem that like they have anything to do with each other. Does and the verse in Exodus really have anything to do with the verse in Genesis other than there happens to be a single word that connects them? Does the verse in Genesis have anything to do with the verse in Proverbs other than a single word that connects them? It's such a strange derivation. And every year when you search for chametz by candlelight, this is why you're doing it because of this strange connection of verses. So tonight I wanna to try to unravel, unravel these. What is it that we mean by that? And let me begin if I can with the very last verse. Let's forget about everything else, but let's just actually look at Proverbs chapter 20, okay? And I wanna begin by asking you a question about that verse in chapter 20. Does anyone wanna take a stab at summarizing the meaning of that proverb in your own words? Right? How would you, what does that proverb even mean? Proverbs are like riddles. The book of Proverbs is a book of riddles. King Solomon even says it in the beginning of his, uh, in the introduction to his, uh, to his work. Um, and so the question I have for you, and feel free to either raise your hand or put it in the chat or, um, or just grab the microphone. But my question to you is, how would you understand the meaning of this last verse in your own words. And I'm going to repeat the verse twice. Ner Hashem nishmat adam, chofes kol chadre baten. A candle of God is the soul of man. It searches all the insides of one's stomach. Again, ner Hashem nishmat adam. A candle of God is the soul of man. It searches all the insides of one's stomach. What a strange verse. What do you think it means if you would be explaining this proverb in plain English? What do you think a candle of God is the soul of man? It searches all the insides of one's stomach. What in the world is that talking about? Anyone want to take a stab at that? I, I kind of feel that the issue is that if you're taking something like literally, 
it's a bit, it's going to be hard. But if you take it and look at what, at the symbolism in it, because first of all, it's, I think, the, first of all, the narrative is a little bit obvious, but when you're actually talking about what's going on with humanity, trying to talk about doing a search on yourself, because reality is, and I think it's far them have a great minute where they actually reenact the, it's yes, it's fine, but I think it challenges us this, to actually see how we can actually make sure we know all of our, what goes on inside both ourselves and the world. Okay, so you, Justin is suggesting that there, there's a kind of ethical component to the search, but again, I want you to forget about Badi Chachametz for a moment. We're not talking about Badi Chachametz anymore. We're not even talking about the Joseph story anymore. We're just talking about the book of Proverbs. Imagine you're learning through Tanakh, and you're up to Proverbs chapter 20, and you're learning with your eight-year-old child, and you get to this proverb, and you have to explain the proverb. So Justin, you're touching on an explanation of the proverb. What would you say the proverb means? Ner Hashem nishmat adam. That you know what the soul of man is? The soul of man is a candle of God. It searches all the insides of one's stomach. What does the proverb mean? What's it trying to say? The soul, <clears throat> maybe you can say that the soul cuts through anything that's physical or superficial. So it, it cuts through the, to the heart of, a, of any matter, <clears throat> specifically spiritual uh, matters. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the soul and it's a candle of God and it searches the inside of one, one's heart. Is there an English word for what, for the subject of this proverb? What is the author of Proverbs talking about in English? The soul of man is a candle of God that searches through the insides of one's heart. He's talking about a very familiar concept in English. What would you say it is in a single word? Conscience. Conscience. He's talking about conscience. What is conscience? What is conscience? And the author of Proverbs has a radical idea of what conscience is. Other Proverbs says conscience is something on loan from God. You can think of it as a candle. It illuminates. And, and why would you say, Rochelle, Rochelle is how you pronounce your name? Why, yes. would, why would you say that the, the candle of God illuminates the insides of your stomach of all places? Why your stomach? What? Where do you feel? If you're conscious, you have pangs of conscience, where do you feel them? Well, you might feel... You do something wrong, you might feel bad for it. And, and that might. And you feel bad in your gut, right? You feel bad inside, you feel bad in your stomach. And so it's almost as if in the metaphor, there's what, what the conscience is, is that there's something illuminating. It's like a candle, it's illuminating something hidden that's inside you and you're finding something that doesn't belong. So what Mishli is really talking about here is conscience. And at some level, the Gemara is associating this idea of Dika al with the search of conscience, how conscience searches within us. So that's the beginning of a clue to what's going on. But let's then continue and just, again, try to make sense of this very strange thing, that somehow all of this is associated with the Joseph story and, and, and the, you're not finding bread at home is like finding, like, I would think like, what in the world does my search for bread at home have to do with the search for the silver goblet with Benjamin, like the search for the silver, that was a search for a silver goblet, that wasn't a search for, for Hamates, right? So why would the Gemara think that the search for the silver goblet was even meaningful as a source for the search for Hamates, not the same thing? Wasn't Yosef trying to search his brother's conscience and morality now to see whether they were going to defend Benjamin? So that's a really interesting question. Was there a search of conscience in this story? And exactly how did it work? And if so, how was it related to Hametz? How, may if I, at all, was it related to bread? May I make a suggestion? Because I think the one thing that I know we don't really like relying on Midrash, but I think if we could pull something in, because you think about the one thing that all, both of these things have in common is 
Magas Koshek, when there was actually searching of Egyptian property for the treasure and valuable to know, so that when they come out, they know where it is. So I think maybe that would help with the with the with what you're trying to build here. Okay, possibly. So with, with the truth is between Mishle and Embracian and Shmot, we got a we got three balls in the air as is. So let's just stick with these three balls and see what we can what we can make of them for a minute. What I want to do is actually take a little bit of a deep dive with you into the story, uh, into the Joseph story that the Gemara is the point of the Joseph story that the Gemara is highlighting the search of Benjamin Sack and see if we can begin to, um, to understand it. Um, the, so uh, let's take a look at that, that element of the story for a moment, the search of Benjamin Sack. And I wanna ask you a, um, a question about it. One overall question is like, what in the world exactly does Joseph think he's doing here? Now, it might be the case that Joseph, right? Because he's framing his younger brother. Like, why is he even, why is he even doing that? Now, a simple possibility might be that, you know, he, um, wants to keep his brother safe, you know, for all he knows, the last time he was with the brothers, when he was 17 years old, things were not great between the children of Rachel and the children of Leah. The children of Leah were ganging up on the children of Rachel. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Imagine you set sight on your brothers for the first time in a couple of decades. They come looking for food. They don't know that you're Joseph. They think you're just some high Egyptian official. And you count up the brothers and one's missing. And you realize the one that's missing just happens to be your only bro blood brother from your mother, Rachel, and he's gone. Like you might think, oh my gosh, like I know what they did to me. They threw me in a pit. What, what in the world have they done to Benjamin? You could imagine that he's on an Entebbe mission to find Benjamin. You know, he'll lie, cheat and steal anything that it takes to get Benjamin. And once he finally sees Benjamin, he wants to keep him. So, you know, he'll frame him and then he'll find the thief and he'll keep him there in Egypt. And, you know, and the, and the other brothers will say, we'll stay here too. And Joseph is like, no, I'll just take the thief. You guys can all go home. And in his head, he's thinking, you know, I'll just stay here with Benjamin and we'll set up the Confederate States of Rachel on the other side of the Nile. We'll do our own thing. We'll send everybody else home. And one can understand in general, perhaps that's Joseph's mission that's what he's trying to do here but if that's isn't true, he trying to see how they'll react it's possible also that he's trying to see how they'll react and it's also possible that he's simply trying to get rid of them that one of the great unknown questions is does joseph ever plan on revealing himself you see if you say that he's trying to test his brothers and once they pass the test he's planning on revealing himself the one problem with that theory is that the words when Joseph does reveal himself as lo yachol Yosef litapek, Joseph could not hold himself back. And he, he just couldn't. And he revealed himself. That doesn't sound like he was following a plan. It sounds like his emotions got the best of him. But if he could have, he would have stayed, you know, he would have continued to, 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 to hide himself. So it's unclear whether he really plans on ever revealing himself. Either he's trying to test them or he's trying to take Benjamin and tell them all to go home. But whatever the case is, either way, I have a question for you. And the question is, is it significant? The way that Joseph frames Benjamin, did he just happen to choose anything to frame him? Or is there meaning in why he frames them? He, he puts his silver goblet in Benjamin's sack, right? Why would he do that? Is there any meaning to that? And here's another question. If he's trying to frame, ben frame Benjamin and he's gonna do it with a silver goblet, it's also strange that
if you think about it, Joseph does something that seemingly undermines his attempt to frame Benjamin. What does he do to undermine his attempt to frame Benjamin? Think about it. Is this the only time there was silver in the sacks of the in the sacks of the Jews going back to Egypt? It turns out that there is a little detail in the Joseph story, which we often overlook. Um, and that detail has to do with the silver and the sacks. If you remember, when the brothers first come to meet Joseph, they come with money for food. Joseph sends them back with food. But interestingly, he doesn't take their money. And he tells his officers to take the people's silver and to put it back in their sacks. Now, if you look and see what happens, let me actually take you into the text. And let's actually read what happens when the brothers discover that silver, the silver which they thought they paid for Joseph for the food. So let's see if we can pick up in the text. I'm going to share a screen. I don't know if you've allowed me to share screens. Let's see. Uh, you have. Thank you very much. So here is a screen. I'll put Hebrew and English side by side so you can see this together. So look what happens. Um, let's start from verse 25 over here. By Yitzav Yosef, by Yumalawat Klayimbar. So Joseph goes and he fills everybody's sacks with, with wheat. But he also says, La Shiv has Kaspeam Ishal Sako. He tells his henchmen to um, return all the money, all the silver each person to a sack. So he does it surreptitiously without telling anybody. And he tells them to give them also provisions for the way. And so they do that. Now what happens? They leave town, the brothers do. And they, at night, they stop. So they stop at night at a hotel. And they stop to give their donkeys food. And as they do, they reach into their sacks for food for the donkey by Yaret Kaspo. And they see their, their silver, and it's in the mouth of their sack. And so this brother said to his other brothers, he said, my silver's back. I thought we spent it on the food. It's, it's here in my sack. And they, their heart throbbed. They and they were they 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 trembled one to another. They said, "What in the world has God done to us?" Now, let me ask you something. Does that sit well with you? Can you ask any questions about that narrative? Is that a strange narrative at any level? What's strange about that story? Who was well, we, the brother that found the money first? What's that? He must be imprisoned Shimon. They and imprisoned it's probably him. Shimon and Levi that were most responsible for um, uh, what happened to Yosef. It happened to Yosef. So is the brother who found this, uh, the money in the sack Levi? Well, we don't know, but I'm asking you a different question. Just see if you can answer this question, right? Mm -hmm. What is odd about this story? What's odd about the brother's reaction? Would you have reacted that way? Let me ask you a question. Let's take this into a contemporary store, right? You're in Chicago, right? What's the local kosher supermarket in Chicago? Sarah's Tent. Uh, Sarah's Tent. All right, so here you are, you go to Sarah's Tent and uh, you pay for the, and, and you, you have grocery order and you pay for it in cash, right? But as you walk out into the parking lot, you realize that the cashier didn't give you the right change. The cashier gave you an extra $2. And you see it right in your hand. Now, at that point, what's your reaction? You have one of two possible reactions. One is you go back to the store 
you approach the cashier and say, excuse me, I think you gave me an extra $2 of change. Here's the receipt. Here's the extra $2. Have a good day. That's plan A. Plan B is you stay quaking in, the, in your shoes in the parking lot and you look up to the sky and you say, oh my goodness, what in the world has the Lord done to me? I have two extra dollars in my hands, right? Which of the two? Probably the first, right? Most of us wouldn't be, wouldn't be trembling in our boots, calling home and saying, I can't believe what happened to me. There's silver, there's extra silver in my sack. So why are the brothers so scared that there's this extra silver in their sack? Because they got money before that, that they should not have gotten when they sold Yosef into slavery. Ah, very good. And I think Robert is putting his finger on the answer. There's something about silver, guys. Silver is a big deal in this story. The silver goblet, it wasn't just coincidence it was a silver goblet that he put in his sack. It's not a coincidence that Joseph isn't taking silver. Why do you think Joseph's not taking silver? I mean, there's a nice reason why Joseph's not taking silver. The nice reason is if Joseph knows that they're his brothers and I'm going to feed my brothers so a brother doesn't take money from another brother for food. So I'm just going to leave the silver where it is. That's the nice reason. But there's also a dark reason. If you're Joseph, what's the dark reason why you might not want to be taking these guys silver? Because, because it was he, blood money that they, they got from the uh, Ishmaelites from selling Joseph. It's blood money. That the last thing Joseph knows was the silver that was exchanged for him, right? That's what it says. It says that they, they sold him for Esther and Kesed for 20, 20 talents of silver, right? So he knows that. So he looks at the brothers who sold him and it's like, and now you're gonna give me silver? Where'd you get all that silver? How can you have all that silver? And the, and the silver enrages him, right? It's like, oh, I'm taking your silver. So whenever the people are trying, brothers are trying to give him silver, it's like, he's not gonna take the silver. To such an extent, by the way, that he's even willing, if you think about it, he's undermining his whole attempt to frame Benjamin, which is kind of interesting too. Put yourself in Judah's shoes. Benjamin has been framed, right? Now, on the face of it, you say, Judah does, Judah doesn't know Benjamin's been framed. Judah sees that Benjamin has been caught red-handed with the silver goblet, right? But what if you were Yehuda? If you were Yehuda's lawyer, if you were Yehuda's lawyer, what do you think? you actually could say to defend Benjamin. If you were a clever trial attorney, right? What would you say that could raise doubt as to whether or not Benjamin's really guilty with this silver in his sack? But can we look at the fact that in the, in the text itself, it never even tries to defend? I kind of feel it what- is interesting, isn't that like, why, why is it that the brothers don't try to defend Benjamin? especially because there is evidence that they could have relied on to defend him. What's the evidence they could have relied on? What would have at least cast doubt on Benjamin's guilt? Think about it. Is this the first time silver has ever been found in anybody's sack? Right, because no, they had it before. It happened before. And it didn't just happen to Benjamin before. It happened to all of them. Everyone had silver in their sack. Remember what happens, right? They come to Egypt the first time. Joseph sends them home to go fetch Benjamin. On the way home, they all have extra silver in their sack. All of that was a mystery. They don't know why it was there. They come back. They try to actually repay the silver, which they, which was extra from the first time. And they come back with Benjamin. And then... They're sent back a second time, and this time Benjamin has silver in the sack. If I'm the attorney for Benjamin, right, so what's the first thing I say at my court hearing? I say, your honor, excuse me, I'd like to dismiss the case, right? The judge says, why do you want to dismiss the case? You say, well, you know, supposedly my client Benjamin has been caught red-handed with silver, but your honor, this isn't the first time there's unexplained silver in everyone's sack, right? I present to you 10 other witnesses that had silver surreptitiously somehow placed in their sack before. It's a great alibi. 
right? It's, it's just happening again, right? So don't you think that whatever, what, whatever reason there was silver in their sacks the first time might be the reason why there's silver in Benjamin's sack the second time, i.e. someone put it there? Like that's a great alibi, but nobody makes that argument. Why doesn't anyone make that argument? Such a strange thing. But because let's go could, back. What, what's that? Because you could counter it. The first time was their money. Why would they then go and say, oh, I, we got our money back. Why would they again get a silver cup? It wouldn't be a really good argument there. Not really, because they were supposed to pay. They tried to pay. They, they actually, it sounds from the text that they did pay. And what happened was Joseph instructed whoever took the money to put it back in their sacks. So like it, it, it is inexplicable that the silver is there in both cases. So let's get back to the question of, so what's Joseph's thinking? Joseph is putting the silver in their sack. What I wanna do with you actually is actually read through the text for a moment that leads up to this moment of Joseph putting the silver in the sack. We're suggesting that maybe the reason why Joseph's doing it has something to do with the sale of Joseph. I wanna show you now that that's true and to follow the implications of that. And all while keeping in mind a background question, which is, the Gemara seems to feel that the source for Badikat Hametz, the search for Hametz, has to do with the search for the silver in Benjamin's sack. One of our questions is, what in the world is the logic behind that comparison? The search for silver in Benjamin's sack was not a search for Hametz. It was a search for silver in Benjamin's sack, not a search for bread. But if we look carefully at the text, we'll see that that's not true. We'll see that the very first Badikat Hametz in the entire history was actually the search for silver in Benjamin's sack. As it turns out, Hametz was a very important part of the story. Bread was a very important part of the story. Let me try to show you. Let, let me take you back into this text. I'm gonna share with you the screen one more time. Where are we gonna start from? Um, let's start from here, verse 25, verse 24. So let's start, let's set the scene. The brothers are back for the second time. They've got Benjamin in tow and they're ready to finally get the food that's been promised to them. And, Joseph's, and Joseph is about to see Benjamin for the first time. And now we get to verse 25. And all of a sudden, they come and they present the gift, the mincha, the gift that they had brought to Yosef in the afternoon. Now, here's the thing. There's something about this gift, which is very chilling. There's something about this gift that makes it exactly the wrong gift to give Joseph at the wrong time. Does anyone know what was in this gift? This gift plays a small bit role in the story of Joseph. It turns out that when the gift was originally assembled, Jacob, Yaakov had suggested that if you're gonna to go to Joseph already, you should give him a gift. Let's look and see what was in that gift. Let's see if we can find it. It should be right around here. Where is it? Here it is. Vayomer Leim Yisrael, verse 11. So Yaakov said, all right, if you're going to go and take Benjamin, take, <coughs> take a little gift. What's in the gift? Mat Tzri, a little bit of Tzri, Mat Tavash, Mechot, Velot, Motnim Meshkenim. We've heard about four of these things. Mechot, Tzri, and Lot. 
The Chotzri and Lot are these exotic spices, ladanum, balsam, spices, Nechotzri Valot. It just so happens that Yaakov packs the exact wrong thing in this gift. Why is this the worst possible gift that you could send to Joseph? Didn't Anyone Joseph know? go down on the caravan with, where it was loaded with those spices when he was enslaved to Egypt? Give that lady a free Coke. That's the correct answer. It turns out that the caravan of Ishmaelites that brought Joseph down, from, down to Egypt from the pit, that picked up Joseph and brought him down as a slave, was carrying things. What was the cargo? There were no sim, nechot, tzri, and lot. These, this exact mix of smells, of spices, just happened to be what the, what the traders were bringing down to Egypt. So if Yaakov is, well, let's send him with a little taste of Canaan, a little nachot, tzri, and lot, that's the worst possible gift. Because what do you know about smells? What do smells do for you psychologically? Bring back memories. Bring back memories. Smell is a very interesting thing. It's different than taste. You know, during COVID, when people lost their sense of smell, they realized how important smell was to them. Taste, your taste buds can taste six different things, sweet, sour, salty. Do you know your nose? Your nose has the ability to distinguish 100 million different unique smells. It's a far more attuned thing, right? Your sense of smell is very, very highly differentiated. If you have this very exotic sense of smell, if you have this very exotic fragrant perfume of spices, it immediately takes you back. You're transported 20 years earlier. All of a sudden you're on that caravan. And it's like, what worse thing could the brothers do than provide this as the gift for Joseph? He opens it up and he's hit with these smells. So let's watch what happens next. Verse 26. So he comes home and they bring him and, and they bring him this, this gift. And, um, and what happens? Let's see what happens. Right? Kishamu Kisham Yocho Lechem. It turns out that they're about to eat bread. They're about to eat bread. They're about to break bread with Yosef. Now, speaking of 20 years ago, the moment of the sale of Joseph, does eating bread remind you of anything from 20 years ago, the moment of the sale of Joseph? The brothers sat down to break bread while he was in the pit. Exactly. Vayeshvu le'echol lechem, the text says. The brothers sat down to eat bread. They sat down to have a picnic. And now it's like the picnic is going to be reenacted. What a strange thing. That's really remarkable. So it's, it's, it's like, our, as we continue to read this text, it's almost like, like that bringing of the gift to Joseph is almost like this trigger that triggers this like replay of these events. And as we keep on reading, we begin to see more and more elements of this replay. Let's watch. They brought this gift, and they then bow before him to the ground, which, by the way, is what the dream foretold, that the stalks of the other brothers would desperately bow down to Joseph, the standing stalk. Here is Joseph, the standing stalk, in charge of all this wheat. The brothers are desperate for wheat. They're bowing to him as if the dream is being realized. And at that point, now, why does this text bother telling us this little detail? Joseph asks them how they are. Joseph says, hey guys, how are you doing? And the brothers say, we're doing swell, hashalom. And, the brother, and then Yosef says, hashalom avichem azaken. Speaking of how you're doing, how's dad doing? How's your old man? How's your old father? How's he doing? How denu chai? Is he still alive? Vayomru shalom lavdecha lavinu. Oh, old dad, he's doing fine. Aden Uchai is still alive. And they bow down. Now, this sounds like small talk. Why has the Torah spent two entire verses on the small talk? That they asked him how they were doing. Everything is fine. Does the small talk remind you of anything from 20 years ago? Vayishalahem l'shalom. Vayamru ha'shalom avichem. 
What does this remind you of in the sale of Joseph? Anything, anybody? Yes, Yaakov sent sent Yosef um, up to was it Dotan to see about if his if all was shalom with his brothers. Exactly. And that's how he that got. That was the whole purpose of sending Joseph to his brothers to check on how the brothers were doing. And here is Joseph who just gets this gift of these smells that bring him back to twenty years ago, and it occurs to Joseph that he never got a chance to do what his father asked him, to ask how everybody was doing. And so what better time than now, 20 years later, to finish up that business? How you doing, guys? How's everybody, right? Because that was his mission. He had to ask how everybody was doing. All the pieces are falling into place. We're getting a replay of the events of 20 years ago. And the replay continues in the next verse. Rabbi Foreman, yes, it, sir. It, it, is it possible that he, um, this is actually making him think that his father knew what happened because of all of these uh, uh, triggers that he's uh, seeing? Um, uh, you know, is it is he okay with all of this that went on? It's a good question. One of the great questions of the story, and I wrote about this in my book, The Exodus You Almost Passed Over, is what does Yosef think about his father? Was his father complicit? How come there was never any search party for me, right? Maybe, and it's not like nobody was ever kicked out of the family before, right? Back in the times of Abraham, Ishmael, was, there were two children, Yitzchak and Ishmael, and Yitzchak was kicked out of the family. The next generation, there was Yaakov and Esav, and Esav was kicked out of the family. I'm the next generation. Did I just get kicked out of the family? Did the brothers go back to dad and say it was him or us? Like Joseph doesn't really know what happened. Joseph, maybe Yaakov was complicit. He doesn't really know. So Yosef filled with all of this confusion, but he knows that he was taken advantage of back then, right? And all of a sudden the events that are taking place are mysteriously conspiring. It's almost like it's happening again. For example, look at these words. He lifts up his eyes and behold, he sees Benjamin his brothers. For those of you who know the text of Mechirat Yosef well, what does Vayisa Ena Vayar remind you of in the story of the sale of Joseph? They looked up and saw the Ishmaelim. That's exactly right. <laughs> Turns out that when the brothers were breaking bread on the other side of the hill, right? They opened, they lifted up their eyes and they saw something. What did they see? They saw the Ishmaelites coming. Now the same language is used for Joseph seeing Benjamin. Now, if you think about it, it's almost like what the Ishmaelites were 20 years ago, Benjamin is now. And let me explain what I mean. When the brothers were baking bread, they actually had a plan. And the plan then was not yet to sell Yosef as a slave. The plan at that point was to leave him in the pit to die. The reason why they eventually sold him as a slave is because they saw the Ishmaelites. When they see the Ishmaelites, so they lift up their eyes and they see the Ishmaelites, Yehuda has this idea that, oh my gosh, we don't have to kill him. And Yehuda says, Ma betza naro why do we have to kill him? Let's just sell him as a slave. That way we don't kill him. And so in a way, the Ishmaelites saved the life of Yosef. Well, something happens here that almost saves the brothers. It's Yosef lifting up his eyes and seeing Binyamin. Because when he sees Binyamin, he says, is that your little brother that you were talking about? And then he says, let God grant you grace, my son. He almost like gives himself away. He calls Benjamin his son. He's like this close to giving himself away. It's this close to saving the brothers from the trap that's about to shut tight on them. And he's about to cry and reveal himself. It's almost like seeing Benjamin is about to save the brothers, just like seeing the Ishmaelites once upon a time saved Yosef, by Yimair Yosef. But Yosef didn't allow it to happen. His heart was bleeding. He was he felt compassion for his brother, for his brother. But Yvakeshlivkot, he wanted to cry, but he went into a private room and he cried there and he would not reveal himself. Kinichmru Rachamav, by the way. What an interesting word. What does Nun Chet Mem Vav remind you of? Back to, to self. 
nimkaru, right? Lechu v'nimkarenu le'ishmaelim, Yosef had said when he saw the Ishmaelite caravan, well, sorry, Yehuda had said, let's go sell him. And the word for compassion now is the same word for selling. And Yosef somehow retains his composure and says, no, I'm not going to do it. And he goes out and he holds himself back and he says, Simu lechem, let the bread be broken. And of course, what does that remind you of 20 years ago? Let the bread be broken, Simu lechem. It's what the brothers did. After they sold them. Was in the pit. Lechem, right? And now we're all going to eat together. And look at how they eat together. It's a strange thing, verse 32. You can imagine the strange little triangle. Yosef sat himself and ate bread. And the brothers sat at the other end of the room eating bread. And the Mitzrim, the Egyptians who were eating with them, they also sat at the other end of the room. Why do you think you had this triangle with Yosef all alone over here with his bread and the brothers all alone over there with their bread? And the Mitzrim over here all alone with their bread, like what an awkward meal, right? You ever see those pictures of Putin with his advisors, like with a huge table in between them? Like really awkward. How come we have this awkward meal? What does it remind you of 20 years ago? Yosef's alone in the pit. Yosef's He's alone in the corner. Yosef's alone in the corner while the brothers eat bread. Yosef says, we're gonna do it just like we did it the last time. See, the last time, Mitzrayim was all the way over there. I was over here, and you guys were over there. So we're going to reenact the same triangle, right? Where Mitzrayim's over there, and I'm over here, and you're over there, and everybody's eating separately, right? That's what it's going to be. So it, it's remarkable, right? It's all happening again with these memories. Yosef is reenacting the meal. And when it happens... What he does is he breaks bread and sends it and gives portions to all the brothers. But that language for portions is very unusual. Literally, you know, how would you translate that literally? In chapter, in verse 34, if you look at the English, he had portions carried to them from before him. But masaot doesn't really mean portions. Literally, what does masaot mean? Vaisa masaot me'et panav. It's a, such a strange word for bread that, there's, that he's sending. Anybody? What would masaot mean? Burden. Mm-hmm. Burdens. Burdens. What a weird thing. What does it remind you of 30, 20 years ago? Who were carrying burdens? Think about that caravan of Ishmaelites. They were carrying burdens of spices. And then Joseph became just one more burden that they were carrying down to Egypt. It's like Joseph is reenacting the burdens of that caravan of Ishmaelites. While the brothers are eating bread, he's getting loaded onto this caravan of Ishmaelites. And and it's like he's sending these burdens to them and he's just reenacting this sale of Joseph's story. Now, if you think about reenacting this, and let's, and let's continue. When he reenacts it, we then find something remarkable. Why is this important to know? At the meal, Joseph ate and drank with them, but we find that not only did he drink with them, he became drunk with them. And look at the very next story. The very next story is when he commands his henchmen to frame his brother by putting the silver goblet. Isn't it interesting that the verse right before that tells us that Yosef was drunk they, they became drunk together. Now, why would Yosef do that? Why would he get himself tipsy? Why would he get himself drunk? This was painful for him. It was mm-hmm. painful for him. And when, why do people drink at parties? Well, in general, with, as, as a mental health professional, a lot of people drink, a lot of trauma survivors drink in order to numb the pain. 
you numb mm -hmm. the pain of something that's very painful. So it's possible that Joseph is overcome with trauma from what happened 20 years ago, is trying to block it out by drinking. So one possibility is you drink to put the past behind you. Another possibility is you drink to allow yourself to do something in the future. Ah, sure. Which in your right mind, you would never do. Okay. Part of the reason people drink at parties is to get rid of their inhibition so that they would do things that they otherwise couldn't see themselves doing. That's right. What True. is Yosef about to do that he could never in his right mind see himself doing? Frame his brother by putting a silver goblet in a sack. It's such a shocking thing to do. You almost have to be a little tipsy to do it. It's almost like he premeditated. But you know at parties, if you want to let yourself do something, that you otherwise wouldn't do, you purposely get drunk. It's almost like that's what Yosef's doing. Whether it's to drown the sorrows of the past or to allow what's gonna happen or maybe both, right? Yeah. He's getting drunk. Now, let me ask you something. Do you see a connection between the drink over here? Notice that we don't hear about wine. What's the other way you can be drunk without wine? Power. Shechar, the Yishkaru, would be what kind of drink? Whiskey, alcohol. Alcohol or beer, right? Now, what's the common denominator between the menu at the feast? The only thing we know at the menu and the feast is, but is simulechem sit down and let's have bread and alcohol. What's the common denominator of alcohol, be it whiskey, be it beer, even wine? What's the common denominator between all of that and bread? Yeast. Leaven, yeast. Leaven, chametz, fermenting. This is the first chametz story, right? This feast. And in a way, it's going to turn into bedikat chametz. Let's watch what happens next. And so he commands the person who is in charge of his household and says, fill up their sacks as they can carry them, whatever they can carry, fill them up with food. But but put the silver for the food, put the payment back in there and also take the silver the silver, Gvia Kesef, my goblet of silver, and put it in their sacks. Vayas Kidvar Yosef, and they do as Joseph says, in the morning, a boker or morning comes, and they're sent out. And Haim Yatsu has your Lohir Chiku. They didn't go that far. By the way, what does Lohir Chiku remind you of 20 years ago? Yishmelim weren't too far away. When the brothers saw Yosef, right? Vayar. What does it say? Vayiru otame rachok. He saw them from afar, right? At the moment of contact. So here they're not too far. The Yosef Amar and Yosef says to the head of his household, Kum anashim, go find them. And he runs after and says, why did you, why did you repay good with bad? I can't imagine what it is that you've done. And then he accuses them, right? Of theft. He accuses them of theft. Listen to this language. Asher yimatsei oto mavadecha vameit. Whoever, asher yimatsei oto mavadecha, whoever will be, in whoever sack will be found, the goblet, right? What does that word remind you of from 20 years ago? Asher yimatsei oto mavadecha. In whomsoever sack will be found, will be found 20 years ago. What did they say to dad by way of alibi when they came they back? Found the, you know, the say, pasim. This we found, they said. Zot Matsanu, here's what we found. As if there was ever a search. There was never a search. That was a lie. <laughs> we didn't find this. We made up this alibi. Zot Matsanu, Hakarana, do you recognize it? A lie about a search that never happened. And now, one more time, Yosef is engineering a search, a search that's an inverse. He's 
both searches are a sham. The brother's search was a sham because there never was a search. Yosef's search is, boy, we're going to have a search now. And we're going to find the thing that was missing then. And what are we going to find? Silver. Well, what was silver 20 years ago? Silver was what he was sold for. Silver at the bottom of a sack. Here the brothers have sacks. And think about it. They have sacks. And you have silver at the bottom of a sack. What does a sack remind you of? What does a sack look like? A pit. It looks like a pit. Think about it. A sack, a parabola, a pit, a parabola, silver inside a sack, silver inside a pit, as if when Yosef was sold, they just chucked the silver into the pit to pay for him and took him out, right? It's like Yosef is saying, there never was a search for me. So let's have the search. You guys said there was a search. We're going to have a search. And there's silver. But not just silver. What else was in the sack besides silver? By the way, the word for sack is a really interesting word. You know, sometimes the word is sack, as in sack, right? The first time when they went down, the word is sack. But now the word is amtahat. A very strange word for sack, by the way, which never appears again. But if you think about am, amtachat almost as two words in one, you know, what if you read amtachat as emet mitachat? The truth is in the bottom. As if to say, the truth is in the bottom of the sack. The silver is there, right? It's like, if, if you think now why it was, let's go back to that question. Why were the brothers so freaked out the first time they left Egypt when they found the silver at the bottom of their sacks? Because Yosef's always been doing this. He's been re-engineering. He's been looking at the sack as this pit and the silver at the bottom is the silver that, that, that they sold him for. And so the reason why the brothers are all, are all nervous and like, what did God do to us? They can't even put their finger on it, but at some deep point in their souls, their conscience is getting them. And it's saying like, oh my gosh, this feels like something that's familiar. It's like silver at the bottom of a sack, silver at the bottom of a sack, silver at the bottom of a pit, silver at the bottom of a pit. And even though their conscious mind can't put it together, it feels foreboding. It feels scary. And now it's coming to final fruition. There's this search. And the search isn't just a search for silver. It's a search for bread. It's a negative search for bread. It's a getting rid of bread. Interestingly, the same kind of search that Badikar Chametz is. Think about the Badikar Chametz that you're going to do a week from now. Isn't it an interesting search? When you search for something, usually, what kinds of things do you search for? If you're missing a watch and you search for a watch, how is that different than searching for Chametz? on the night you're gonna search for chametz. You don't wanna find chametz. You don't wanna find chametz and you do wanna find your watch. Isn't it interesting that the search for chametz is actually an anti-search. You're searching for something that you want to get rid of rather than something that you wanna find. Well, you know what the original search for chametz is? It was the chametz in their sacks because what else was in their sacks? Look carefully. Fill the food, fill the people's sacks with doggy bags from the meal we just had. Well, what was served at the meal? Bread. Bread was served at the meal. Oh, interesting. So there was bread also in the sack and you wanna get rid of the bread so that you can find, get all rid of all the bread, search the sack, find the bread, get rid of the bread so you can see what's at the bottom of the sack. It turns out though, that there's one more sack or one more pit. In this story so far, we've seen two pits. One pit is the pit that Joseph was in 20 years ago. The other pit is the pit of each brother's sack, that there's silver at the bottom and there's bread inside. 
But you know, thinking about 20 years ago, there was also another pit. What was the other pit 20 years ago? Even when Joseph was in his pit, there was another pit. And believe it or not, it had bread in it. What was that pit? The jail that he was in? No. Right at the time he was being sold and Yosef was in his pit, there was another pit. And that pit didn't have Joseph in it, but had bread in it. What it's, pit was that? It's their stomach. It's their stomach. Their stomach is the other pit. Let me ask you a question. Why does the Torah bother wasting ink telling us that they sat down to eat bread? Who cares? Every time the brothers eat lunch, I need to know about it. Why did I need to know about that lunch? I think that this had to do with uh, later on with the dreams that Yosef interpreted. The one who got killed um, was the was the one who was the baker uh, who would be involved with bread, and the one who was the wine steward went back to his his post. And indeed, uh, I think it's four times in that story, the word coast is being used. And here we have the Gavia. So there's some, I think there must be some connection. Interesting, interesting possibility. But let me keep you on the straight and narrow in terms of simple understanding of text. I'm just a simple reader. I'm your eight-year-old kid. I'm asking you a simple question. Daddy, I know that every word in the Bible is important. Why did the Torah bother telling me about a routine event? Why do I need to know that after the brothers put Joseph in the pit by Yeshu Lecho Lechem? What's the meaning of it? What am I supposed to understand? Why did they do it? Why do I need to know that they sat down to eat bread? So here's- There's leaven question. in the bread. There's leaven in that bread. It was- It comfort. also showed indifference That's to exactly him. exactly right. It showed indifference. Put yourself in the brother's shoes. What's in it for you? Why do you spread the checkered picnic blanket right after Yosef is in the pit, they go over the next hill and they split a, a checkered picnic blanket and they sit down to have a picnic. Why would they do such a thing? What are they trying to do? They're celebrating. They're celebrating the end of Yosef. Celebrating might be too strong. Let's say they're not celebrating. We, we find later that they feel guilty about it. Remember what they say before Yosef, we're guilty, we heard his screams and we didn't listen. And Are he, they trying to fill the pit in his stomach? In their stomachs? Yes. It's the verse in Proverbs. What was going on in their stomachs as they heard the screams of their brothers? Guilt. Guilt, <laughs> where do you feel it? In your stomach. In your stomach. Why would you eat at that particular moment? What are you trying to do? Allay your conscience. Allay your mm -hmm. guilt. Your guilt. If conscience is the thing that searches my stomach, what can I do to silence conscience that's searching my stomach? If I feel like my stomach is making me, is, is, is betraying me, is making me feel guilty and I don't want to own up to it, how do I deal with that? One way to deal with it is fill yourself with bread. Eat a lot, right? And it's almost like, as you said before, I'm not sure who said it. I think it might have been Renee, but I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, right? That it was to convey indifference, right? You know, think about it. If we are spreading a picnic blanket and eating bread, what are we communicating to each other by doing so? Life is normal. Life is normal. On the most abnormal day in the family of Jacob, life is normal. Just another day in Canaan, just having an old, just bringing out the old Barbie, right? The old barbecue, firing up the old barbecue. Everything is normal if we can eat bread now. And as you eat bread, nice, satisfying bread, chametz bread that expands in your stomach, and all of a sudden, the pangs of conscience aren't quite so bad because it's filled with bread. Well, what does Yosef do now? He says, okay, we're gonna take the two pits from 20 years ago and bring them together. 
You see, 20 years ago, there were two pits. There was the pit that was empty that I was in and that the silver was in. And there was another pit called your stomachs that there was a bread in. And because there was the bread in that pit, you guys didn't listen to my screams. You were able to inure yourself to my screams by distracting yourself over the other hill eating. When you guys said, let's go eat lunch. So now you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna bring those two pits together. We're gonna have silver inside of a sack with bread in it. But you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna get rid of the bread. So he gets all of his officers to get rid of all the bread until at the bottom, you find the silver that you never searched for the first time. Well, now maybe you can find it. So what's really happening is a re-engineering of the search for Hamas. Yosef is re-engineering the search. What I want, and what it's all about, I think, is what the Gemara says it's about. This is about conscience, right? Let's go back now to what the Gemara says, right? Read it one more time, and it's going to start to make sense. Let's go back to the Gemara. How do we know that you're supposed to search for chametz la'or haner, by the light of the candle? Well, you know why? Because it says, so'or lo yimatse. It says that leaven should not be found in your houses. And if leaven should not be found, that means you should search for it to make sure that it's not there. Well, how are you going to search for it? Well, what better source than vayimatse hagavia? Then the words vayimatse, same words referring to that, that silver goblet. The Gemara saw all of these connections, saw that the very first search for Hamates was the search for the bread in, Joseph, in, in Benjamin's sack, in all of the brothers' sacks, to get rid of the bread. That was the first story of Badika's Hamates. So by Yimatze Agavia, then they finally found the silver after they got rid of all the bread. Ma'amitziya Murakan al Chipus, right? Just as the, 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 you had to search for the, you had to search in Benjamin's case, so you have to search in this case to make sure there's no chametz there. And how do you know it has to be by the light of the candle? Oh, because speaking of searching, we have that same word in Proverbs that talks to us about conscience. What's the Gemara talking about conscience for? Because it knows that what Joseph was trying to engineer was a different kind of search. Joseph was trying to ignite the brother's conscience. Joseph was trying to say 20 years ago, you know what the problem was? The problem was you dampened your conscience. And here's the great truth that Joseph knows. Conscience is the one thing that can redeem us. When we're doing something wrong, the great question is, how do you deal with conscience? Well, the instinct when you're doing something wrong is what do you do with your conscience? Your conscience is a nag. Your conscience is getting in the way. You do whatever you can to shut up your conscience. So you eat bread. You pretend everything is fine. You spread the picnic blanket. You, you socialize with your friends around a meal and pretend that it's, it's a day in the life of Canaan and everything is fine. But when you do that, you're obscuring the ability of conscience to do what conscience does best. You know what conscience really is? It's not really a part of you, it's a part of God. It's a candle of God inside of you. And you know what that candle is called? Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. The candle of God is the soul of man. You see, it's not that God puts some sort of spyware in us, like this candle that's inside of us called a conscience. If so, like who likes spyware? You know, whenever you get a computer, the first thing you do is you try to get rid of all the spyware. You try to get rid of all the excess software. Who likes spyware? So maybe I should try to get rid of my conscience. The answer is it's not spyware. Do you know what your conscience is? Look at the verse again. Ner Hashem. Nishmat Adam. What the candle of God is? It's your soul. You know what your soul is? It's the deepest part of who you are. It's your fundamental identity. Your deepest self is your conscience. And that's what Yosef was trying to teach the brothers. You aren't supposed to eat bread to get in the way of your conscience. Your conscience isn't something to be avoided. It's you. 
It's nothing more than you. Who are you? Your deepest humanity is your conscience. Where did you get your humanity from? On loan from God. We're Tselem Elohim. We're in the image of God. So our deepest humanity is our conscience. If you feel pangs in your stomach, do you know what that is? That's your conscience talking. That's you talking. That's your identity talking. Your conscience is your best friend. It's actually God talking. It's, it's, it's you. It's, it's a little spark of God inside of you. And you know what's actually nice about it? You know, one of the reasons I think why we silence our conscience when we're doing something wrong is we're actually so deeply ashamed of what it is that we're doing that we just can't bear it. So we try to silence our conscience because we can't de deal with it. But the truth is, if you ask yourself, what is your conscience? And you come to the re a realization that conscience isn't something external from me. It's not this little angel that's on my left shoulder. It's my soul. It's me. It's ner Hashem nishmat adam. It's the soul of, of man. And that's illuminating my stomach. And if my soul, which comes from a higher place, God, isn't feeling comfortable being in the same stomach with this sin and is feeling uncomfy. So do you know what's nice about that? It says that I'm still okay, that my humanity, I'm still human, that despite that I've done this thing that's wrong, this thing that's wrong is something I've done but my essential humanity I still have. The fact that I'm feeling conscience means that I have my essential humanity. I have the soul from God. I still have this pure soul. So how bad can I be? You know, there's this interesting book that talks about the difference between shame cultures and guilt cultures. It says that, you know, if you live in a shame society, it's really problematic, right? But I think what this is teaching you is that, is that you have to separate your behavior from yourself right? Okay, I did this bad thing, but I've still got this conscience inside. I still have this soul. And the very fact that it does feel bad means there's a soul inside me that feels bad. So let me embrace that soul. That's my essential self. And now I can deal with my behavior. It's basically God's way of saying your humanity is still intact. And now deal with what you did. And so Yosef has said, let's, let's have a search. Let's engineer a search for the search that it was never had. And what happens during that search? So I want to close by actually looking with you in the text of what happens during that search. And let me just take a moment to show it with you, and then I'll wish you guys a good Pesach. If you look at the search, we'll get back to that question now of why it was that the brothers don't defend Benjamin. Joseph has that opportunity, Judah has that opportunity, but instead he says the following. Vayomer Yehuda, and Yehuda says, Mano mar ladoni, what can I possibly say to my master, to you? How can I possibly justify myself? God found the sin of your servants. We should be slaves to you. Let us all be slaves to you. Let me ask you, why did Yehuda not protest his innocence. Yehuda gives in and says, God found the sin of your servant, a sin which they weren't even responsible for. Here's the question. What did Yehuda mean when he said, God found the sin of your servants? If you're Yehuda, what are you thinking when you say those words? Originally selling Yosef. Exactly. He's not talking about the sin of the silver goblet. He's talking about the sin of the 20 pieces of silver for selling Yosef. What he's seeing is the resonance of the situation. He's feeling the guilt. The reason why he, he's feeling now that, that that pit in his stomach as he sees the reenactment of the story of Yosef, the events of 20 years ago are coming back to haunt him. The same way the spices brought back those events to haunt Joseph, the reenactment is bringing about the, is bringing about the, the sense of guilt for Yehuda. And he's saying, God has found the sin. God has found the sin of your, of your servants. 
And what he really means is the original sin, the sin of Mechirat Yosef. Now, I want to close with one last subtlety here. You know, if you think about this and you go home, you might say, ah, Foreman, that's really very interesting, but I have a problem with your theory. Here's the problem with your theory. It's all very nice to say that Yehuda, um, you know, felt guilty for what happened when he said, Elohim Matzah He was like seeing how like all of these, you know, just like all of these events are conspiring to be like 20 years ago. It must be in the hand of God. But then when Yosef reveals himself, doesn't Yehuda realize the truth? And doesn't he realize that Yosef made it all happen? So it's not really true that God found the sin of his servant. Yosef, it was all a put off. It was all a con. Yosef is the guy. It's actually Yosef. Yosef engineered this whole thing. He was just redoing the events of the sale. So it's not really true that God found my sin. It wasn't that God was making these events happen, Bashkacha. It was Yosef making it all happen. You know why Yehuda doesn't say that at the end? Because what did he really mean when he said his conscience? He meant his conscience. He meant his the neshama. He said he meant his neshama. He meant I sense the candle of God inside me. I sense my humanity. My humanity, by being in this position, feels bad for what I've done. And you know what my humanity is? It's God. It's God. It is the soul. My soul is just God. That is where the verse in Mishlei comes from. So when the Gemara quotes that verse in Mishlei, it's not quoting any old verse in Mishlei. It's quoting what Yehuda was talking about. That's what Yehuda meant when he said, God found my sin. It means my conscience found my sin. My conscience is God. My conscience is on loan from God. And it was Yehuda's recognition that his conscience is on loan from God that allows him not to be crushed by the guilt. Allows him to say, you know what? I'm still human. I'm still godly. The fact that I feel bad is the reason that I can do tshuva. The fact that I feel bad is my soul finding something that it's uncomfortable with. That means I'm human. That means I'm godly. And that means I can return. And that's what he meant. Which means that ultimately, what the search was about, getting rid of all that bread to find the silver, was about freeing the conscience that gets distracted. And that's what B'dikar Hametz is for us. B'dikar Hametz at some level is, you know, you can use alcohol, you can use bread, you can use fermented things to play games with your conscience, right? But somehow don't play those games, right? Take seven days off. And in a way, if you ask yourself, if we got down to Egypt through the sale of Yosef, what do we do on the flip side to remember the sale of Yosef? The answer is we don't eat chametz. We search for chametz and get rid of it. Because at some level we realize that chametz played a role in the sale. It was that which allowed the sale to happen. It's the sitting to eat bread was the thing that the brothers felt guilty. They heard the screams of the brothers. They said, I heard the screams of the brothers. Why didn't they act? Why didn't they pull them out of the pit? Because something got in the way. What got in the way? The picnic got in the way. Without the picnic, the sale of Yosef never happens. Without the picnic, we don't go down to Egypt. Without the picnic, Jacob ends up building the tribes of Israel there. There is no sheep of Mitzrayim. At some level, it's chametz. It's the picnic that got in the way that allowed us to obscure our conscience. And I think what we do on Pesach, when we get rid of that, is we say we're willing to live without that for seven days and to try to be clear-eyed and try to understand that conscience isn't something to be devoid, avoided, but as difficult as it is, we can embrace it. And what allows us to embrace it? The understanding of Elohim Matzat Avon Avdecha, Yehuda's understanding that it's not some pesky angel on my left shoulder that I'm trying to get rid of. What that's, that is my conscience. My conscience is me. My conscience is my humanity. My conscience is my soul and my soul is godly. And as long as I have a godly soul that feels bad, I can embrace my humanity 
and I know that I'm not a goner, that I'm not sunken by my failings. So that I think is what Mechiras, what B'dikas Chametz possibly is about according to this Gemara and Psachim. And I want to wish you guys a wonderful Pesach and a wonderful Chametz free seven days, eight days. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Ford. you. Thank, thank you. you. Hey. Hey, David. Hey, nice to see you, Glenn. Good to see you all. Okay, guys, happy trails in Chicago. Hope it's not too cold over there for Pesach. Hope you got some nice, beautiful spring. And uh, for those of you who are going away, enjoy it. For those of you who are, who are sticking around, enjoy it. And thanks for taking the time out to chat with me tonight. Sure. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night. Thank you.